What's on, where, and when? It's the Talk of Nelson. NBS Talk Nelson. At NBS, we believe in banking for life. For over 160 years, we've been a trusted banking provider for generations of locals like you. We know our clients personally and build long-term relationships with them, offering flexibility by giving our staff freedom to make quick decisions to put them first. Experience banking for life with NBS. The Marco Rugby Roundup. Welcome to the Marco Rugby Roundup. I'm Chris Butler and joined by my co-host, Les Edwards. Great to have you back, mate. Thank you very much, Chris. Looking forward to the show. And we must point out uh, at the start of the show how people can listen. So you can go to talknelson.co.nz. Uh, we've got YouTube clips there and also MBS Talk Nelson on Spotify as well and through, obviously, social media channels. But uh, Spotify is always a good option, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, we're thrilled to bring you another episode packed with the latest rugby news from around the top of the South Island. Once again, broadcasting from the Turf Hotel, Main Road Stoke, and we'd like to say thanks to Stan and his team for all their support. And uh, another busy weekend on Friday is the place for live music. Uh, check out Take Me Out on Friday. Saturday, it's Trilogy, and then on Sunday, the return of the Eve Kelly duo, who was doing a national tour, a very popular last time. The other addition that you can't quite see it at the moment, we can tell you when you come here above the stage area, we have the Hot Wings Challenge. And we've got two boards, the Wall of Flame and the Wall of Shame. So, yeah, it's like they're going to make you do the challenge and then shame you out if you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a kilogram of very, very hot chicken wings, as I understand it. So uh, I'd be on the Hall of Shame, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't agree. Know. Me too. I, I don't think there's going to be a bigger list on that side. We can do that. But um, perhaps we'll give you an update of how things are going on that. Uh, this week, we're diving into senior rugby, as well as super rugby men's and women's competitions. And today joining us is Cade Whiting, assistant coach with the Wyoming Old Boys Club. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Cade, uh, great to have you here, mate. Uh, we'll talk more to you in depth, but tell us a little bit about the family connection with uh, the, the Wyoming Club. Yeah, well, it's an interesting one, that one, actually. Uh, I mean, early on, there was no connection. So uh, I was the first uh, member of my family to be associated with Wyoming growing up as a kid. Um Going back in time, my whole family is actually associated to Stoke Rugby. Um, so, it's a, <laughs> uh, and I've still got family associated there currently. So, um, yeah, so it was a big change. And, yeah, you know, it creates a bit of controversy in the family, but it's good. It's good. I enjoy it. So, yeah, good in-house rivalry. So, uh, most of the family was at Nayland College. Yes, correct. And your father's Dwayne. Yes, is that correct? That's correct. And um, yeah, they were um, all uh, Nayland boys, and um, I remember them all playing at Stoke. So, yeah, what happened? How come the change to Wymere? Uh, I guess just growing up as a kid, I was out in uh, we lived out in Richmond. Ah. Okay, and that was the the main thing. It was going to play footy with your mates, you know. So when I was five or six years old, it was a stone throw down the road and down to Jubilee Park, um, now my home home field that I love so much. So, yeah, I guess that was where it all started. And from there, the family ties connected. Um, Dad stepped into JAB and being on that side and progressed through as I progressed through. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where that's led to. So you got two uncles. Um, Three, yeah. Two, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, where are their allegiances? Uh, so... Kyle, uh, who's the youngest brother, he's uh, Stoke through and through. I think he's been um, on the on the side there with, with its president or club captain along those lines. Absolutely. So he's he's been tied in. And um, then I've got a brother-in-law who my sister's married to. He's uh, Steve Kerr. So he's been played over 100 games for Stoke and now on the coaching side, I believe, or just drinking beers. I don't know what he's doing, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, and another uncle who's in between both clubs, isn't he? Yeah, well, you got Brent, who's uh, he's he's sort of grew up through Stoke, but then followed me, jumped ship, and followed me, and it's it's quite good having him on board. He 
rips into the Stoke boys, but then he'll be down there having a beer with them too at the same time. So, <laughs> Thanks for yeah. being each way. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and your mum, of course, a, a champion netballer in a day and, and sisters who play the game as well. Yes, yes. So they play netball and um, now we've got prices who have now combined with one old boys uh, in a combined session there and we've got prices one netball. So it's quite good. My mum still plays at her rare age of... I won't say that. No. <laughs> Good man. Um, but yeah, she plays and she coaches the Premier Women's team, which now uh, my si- I've got two sisters involved in that too. So yeah, it's great. Awesome. Oh, there you go. Very sporting family, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. but interesting, isn't it? That the the the, uh, the allegiance, the crossover, a, a crossed over. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, we'll talk more to you about your background in rugby in the show but let's get on with senior club rugby the tasman trophy and les how did uh this weekend go yeah well so maris went over to lansdowne park and took on central um and central retained the john goodman challenge trophy much to my chagrin mm-hmm. but <laughs> the, the that's the way it rolls uh maris had oh 60 percent of the possession but central are just such a good club when it comes to mm-hmm. important matches with you know titles or trophies on the line so um, their defence against a lot of ball was outstanding in the first half. Maris failing to take their points on offer. Um, it was just a game where, you know, Maris looked like they should win it, but Central just continued to battle away. They had two chances, took them both. Uh, Maris had about five and took one. So, look, this Central is a very, very good team, and anyone who plays them, especially at home, is going to find it a tough battle. Kaurangi, um, fairly comprehensive win there. So uh, tell us a bit about that one, Kay. Yeah, I think uh, the score doesn't reflect the game as oh. such. Um, it was it was very close, and Kaurangi scored some um, good breakaway tries, to, you know, to really take that game away. But I think um, they're a strong side as as per. They've been at the top or nearabouts for the last three or four years. Yeah. So you know they're they're going to be competitive no matter what. And I think for us, it's just we're at a building stage, and we we've, we've got new guys into the team we've got older heads coming into the team so it's creating those combinations and you know that'll come as as the season progresses so Mootsri yes I mean I feel sorry for you know Gary because he works hard with his team but I'm a little bit pleased for Mootsri because um, you know it just it it shows the curve going upward yep so uh, and it does it does demonstrate that so it was at Spring Creek home ground advantage for Mootsri um, leading, oh, won the game eight five. I think it was five all for quite a considerable amount of time, uh, and then a late penalty got the game uh, in the in the chocolates for for uh, Mutri. Yeah, well, well done to them. Next week, Gary, <laughs> come on, Nelson. Round four, and it's all on this weekend. I think the weather's looking all all right because oh. would have been pretty. Uh, wet, wasn't it? They decided to keep the grounds going, but uh, how was it underfoot? Uh, it was dried up all right, actually. Like the, we, it cleared out as that afternoon came on. I think it was a bit wet that ball, maybe to start for the first twenty, but it was sun was shining after that, so yeah. can't complain. I, I think it was a bit wetter over the hill, especially uh, where a Mutri and Nelson were playing potentially. I think. Yeah. yeah. So but, Lansdowne was in great nick, and uh, yeah, it held up very, very well. I don't think there's any uh, any problems playing a game there this weekend. So yeah, it was good conditions and not too hot for the players. So that was great. Great, fantastic. Okay, round four. What's the lineup there, Les? So, uh, Cade's team, Waimere Old Boys, are going to host Central at Jubilee, and and that'll be an interesting game. But how yeah. do you feel about that? Oh, how you prepare? As you've said, Central. You know, they're a strong team. Um, there's no doubt about it. They've got the experience in the right places. Um, they've got guys that have been there for years, and then they've got that youth and talent, and and actually pace and power too. I think yeah. out wide. So. I mean, going forward to them, we've just got to focus on ourselves, um, keep building on our season because it's early doors. But, I mean, I think we can give them a real run for their money. You know, we've got the guys there. It's just trying to click, click together at the right time. And, you know, if we put them under pressure, you just never know. Yeah, dead right. Um, and, and they will defend. They will defend tenaciously. So, you know, a couple of moves to break them down will be very handy. Yeah. Um, for us, uh, for Maris, uh, at Trafalgar Park, but it's a Nelson home game. So uh, Gary Stevens will have his side well prepared to take us on. Uh, three o'clock Trafalgar Park. And then the third game 
uh, is Stoke Kaharangi. Yes, that's, that's probably the road here at Green Meadows. Yeah, yeah, that's um, so uh, a, couple, a couple of the Titans clashing there, aren't they? So it's going to be a great game. What are your thoughts on that one? Do you think? Oh man. <laughs> every Can't game, all, look, all these, yeah. all seven clubs are, are, are in with a shot every weekend. I think oh, it's the closest uh, competition it is, isn't it? Closest and, it's been in a long time. And I, and I think I'd rather not stick my neck out here. <laughs> Friends in both clubs. Um, so yeah, that that'll be, and the crowd will be big at Green Meadows. So that mm-hmm. might give them a bit of an edge. Uh, Mootery have the buy, of course. Uh, the points table central, just sitting at the top, not far behind Les uh, Marist. Uh, oh, sorry. And now I've got Central there twice. So, um, so we've got Central Marist, and would it be Kaharangi after that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then Stoke, not far behind, but it's uh, very early days. Super Rugby round eight and Moana Pacifica. Pacifica. We talked about, you know, how they're travelling last week and uh, hoping they get up for a win, and they did it, and they beat the Reds. Yes, definitely uh, a good win for them. I thought. Um, 17 14 was the result. Uh, this is the thing with Moana Pacifica. You get them and you give them the home ground, which was Whangarei in this instance, and they're going to be a different proposition to when they're on the road. So, uh, yeah, they'll be very pleased with that win. It, it just it just helps make their season more enjoyable going forward, I would think. And I saw a short piece on a young fellow from Blenheim who's an absolute speedster, yeah. and I can't recall his name, but he got called up for Samoa? Uh, Kyron, yeah, Kyron Tomafalau. Yeah. So he's uh, he did play uh, sevens for Tonga, didn't he? Tonga, right. Yeah, wonderful. Gift and he got called up for the Rugby World Cup, apparently, as well, mm-hmm. and yeah. played in that. Yeah. And he's, geez, got some pace. Man, yeah. he could fly. Yeah. yeah, and I think it was good. Uh, you know, you also had your Tasman boy, Willie Havili, you know, sealing the deal in that game. So, you know. Yeah, he did a uh, really strong effort to score the winning try and throw yeah. up a fin at the same time. So play, really pleased for them uh, to get that game. Of course, the the big one that we were all watching um, was Waratah's Crusaders no, no, at 9.35 on Friday. <laughs> I just couldn't believe that because I was actually um, uh, interrupted. You know, it's like you come to it for a family sit down and, then, you know, they want to watch a, a romance comedy and they don't want to watch the rugby. But, of course, they all get into a conversation. They skip out of the kitchen. So here's me changing channels to check the score. And at one point I'm going, A, 40, oh, what's going on here? And I managed to catch the end. Just unbelievable. Can you talk us through that one, Les? I only seen the highlight oh, today. Okay, so you know, I was really disappointed for the Crusaders because I thought they'd turned a corner, but every time they scored points, the Waratahs would score points. The lead just chopped and changed about thirteen times. You know, it was it was remarkable. Um, and then uh, uh, the Crusaders could have iced the game in the you know eightieth minute mark, but apparently they would they left a little bit of time on the clock which allowed a restart and then the waratahs got the ball and kicked a kicked a golden point field goal so uh yeah daggers daggers through the heart for the crusaders uh, supporters and the players uh, 43 40 it, it was an interesting game you know it, it was quite exciting because the league changed so often but you know it, it was just it was kind of weird that the crusaders couldn't put this one away and do do you think you know the coach was disappointed after the game about their performance? But do you think maybe the Waratahs stepped up? I mean, was it particularly the Crusaders playing bad? Oh, the home ground advantage would have helped the Waratahs. They had a good crowd there supporting them. Uh, look, every again, every team's a good team in in Super Rugby, um, and and home being at home, you know, always does help. So. The Crusaders will be disappointed that they uh, didn't get their second win, win of the season. Uh, got a shout out to Shannon Apapa, uh, chief supporter. <laughs> and okay, I may happen to favour the Hurricanes. <laughs> well, you got I the mean, we don't, it, we've been long and suffering, so uh, we're going to take this while we can, while the, while the uh, we're riding high. But geez, 36 uh, 23. And uh, I didn't actually see the full game, but uh, what were your thoughts? Did you happen to catch the full game? Same thing. I've just seen the highlight highlights. On that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Hurricanes, they're just outstanding form at the moment, aren't they? So, I mean, both teams are, but it just shows where the Hurricanes are at. You know, they lose a key halfback, but another key halfback can come in and, you know, have an influence on the game like that. So they've, they've got depth and they've got 
the right guys in the right positions, and that's what it comes down to. Yeah. So a fool of the hooker. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just had a barnstorming game. He's he seems to have found his second wind in his career. Um, you know, do you remember he was once a project for the All Blacks, then mm. then went uh, quiet, but now I think he's an absolute form hooker. He was magnificent, and Ruben love at fullback. He he's got skills. You'd love to yeah. have those skills, wouldn't you, Kate? Right, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, and the pace, and he's got yeah, he's got it all at the moment. So. Yes. Yeah, so is he a bolter for All Blacks? That well, are... the, the, you know, he's in the talk, you know, when they start talking about that name. And um, so I'm sure he's thereabouts. Oh, very mm. talented, very, very gifted. So, yeah, it was, a, it, it was a good win for the Hurricanes, 36-23. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think the, the TAB had the Chiefs' as favourite mm. in this one, even though it was in Wellington. So, yeah, the Hurricanes would be delighted and have a really good, strong lead in the comp now. And here's the thing, the Rebels, 47, beat the Highlanders, 31. Because I was looking at the table and I was saying, hang on a minute, the Rebels aren't far behind. You know, they're up there. And, um, you know, so after all the controversy and the money issues and all of that, it's it's like it, it's made them stronger. It's brought them together and saying, well, look, it's do or die, guys. If we don't perform here, we could be out. Yeah, so Martin Devlin had written them off. and He's now eating humble pie, <laughs> quite prepared to admit it, because yeah. they're now in fifth spot. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a very good chance for them to to continue to improve. So, um, you know, you, you, your top four is Blues, Hurricanes, Brumbies and Chiefs, and then the Rebels and Fiji and Drew have got yeah. a home game this week, uh, snapping at their heels. So let's talk about that, and uh, we'll go around the table. Uh, first of all, Fiji and Drew versus the Hurricanes in Suva, and it's a bit of a banana skin uh, playing in Suva, isn't it? It is, and I mean, I actually caught up with uh, Mecca Springer the other week there um, as he come back from his duties, and he's just saying those Crusaders boys after that game, you know, they were off their feet, and yeah. you know, it's a it's a whole different level playing over there in that heat and that that climate, and you know, that's that's all it takes. And those Fijian boys, they know what to do in that. So, I mean, the Hurricanes are a strong team if they can get through. I mean, you're a bit bit deeper in the season, so the fitness should be there, but it's it's the heat that gets them. So yeah, yeah. So hydration is the key, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? You know, lots and lots of water. Uh, this one's a five o'clock game in Suva, mm-hmm. seven o'clock here in in New Zealand. So uh, maybe not quite as hot as the Crusaders had to put up with a four, uh, what a one pm yeah. game. But yeah, home ground advantage here is really good for the drawer. But you know, I would have to think that the Hurricanes can get up uh, even with the travel. Reds versus Hollanders in Brisbane. Up the Hollanders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they need I mean, it. Go the Highlanders. They need it. Don't they, they? they do need it. And the, but the Reds, you know, they had a loss, so they they're going to want to bounce back. Geez, this is a good game, isn't it? The Blues versus the Brumby in Auckland. Yeah, I think it's an outstanding game. Well worth uh, getting in front of a tally for. So seven o'clock on on Saturday. Um, Brumbies mm. just pretty talented side, aren't they? They yeah, they've always been there. They're about seven at the yeah. top of the, the Australian leader. So I mean. I think the Blues will be too strong at home, but you just never know, you know, with the Brumbies that they, they yeah. can turn up and, you know, one bounce of the ball mm-hmm. and it's all theirs. So. But that one bounce of the ball means it's going to be close, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. I, th- I think this one is Blues 12 and under. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll have to be diligent, um, you know, throughout the 80 minutes. The Force versus Crusaders in Perth and Force not travelling so well, but... They always seem to go okay at home, you know. Um, Home is a place they do enjoy, and they'll be maybe smelling a bit with the Crusaders. You know, they might be thinking, but, you know, maybe it's time for the Crusaders to clip too. We said that last week. Yeah, I think this is a key one. (laughs) A key one. You know, they they only need to get another few wins under the belt to make that top eight, don't they? So Yeah, it's getting more and more difficult. I thought last week was a must win from that point of view. So it's 11th plays 12th. Uh, this game, uh, yeah, right. so you know the Crusaders will just want to get out there and secure themselves four points minimum. Yeah. Super Rugby our picky, and it was the final. And is this going to be the double for the Blues this year? Mm-hmm. Uh, the women beating the Chiefs twenty four to eighteen, and I saw the highlights, and uh, looked like a, a good game, and perhaps a mistake from the Chiefs uh, drop ball and. Um, 
uh, Blues managed to get on top and and, and get over the line. So yeah. what were your thoughts on that one, Liz? Well, the Chiefs had an 18-5 lead into the second half. So as you say, one mistake and all of a sudden it turned for the Blues and they got the momentum and and, and ran out winners, uh, worthy winners, two try, uh, four tries to two. Um, and so... Yeah, outstanding uh, day for the for the Blues woman, and I'm sure they had a great time uh, celebrating that in what was a pretty decent season of Super Rugby, our picky. You're with the Marco Rugby Roundup. Our very special guest is Cade Whiting. And Cade, it's early days in the Tasman Trophy. Played two and won one. Uh, are you happy with the senior playing numbers? And how is your Premier team travelling at the moment? Yeah, definitely early days. Yeah. Um, we we've actually got some good depth this year, which is great from what we've had over the last couple of years. Um, the biggest thing we've had some older boys come back in, and then we've recruited well too with some younger guys from out of the region, straight out of school, and those sort of things. So, so what happened in the off season? Because even in the off season, even I heard about it. People were getting yeah. phone calls. Some was saying, "Well, you know, do I make the comeback or do I spend half the week not being able to walk?" You know, <laughs> the call went out, didn't it? What was the discussion? Uh, well, yeah, we we had a wee conversation there with someone that came to us, and I think we'll talk about that a bit later. <laughs> but um, yeah, someone came to us, and he, you know, he wanted to field out some of the other old boys that, you know, I don't think they've finished their careers yet. You know, they sort of just stepped away because they had other commitments, whether it's family or whatever it may be. But yeah, they've all come back into the fold and, and it's great to have them on board. You know, mm. their experience is, you know, is key and vital moving forward, I think. Uh, no doubt you're enjoying working with Scott Mack and McKenzie. So he was on the show last week. Great character. Um, how do you split those responsibilities? Yeah, so Mac is he's he's unreal and he's he's great for the culture. You know, he's a he's a real people person and mm. and that's what I enjoy about him. So, mm. you know, he's he's our head coach. Um as as we see, and he he pretty much coordinates how we all work and together, and and that's his role. And he looks after some defense as well. Uh, myself, I look after attack in the backs, um, which is great. And then we've got Leith running, um, and he's on board with the forwards and the set piece. And we've actually had one of the other brothers sneak in, Mike Coman, this year as well. Okay. So yes, he's he's floating here or thereabouts. Might be in on a Tuesday and then turn up on a Saturday, and he's just helping some guys out individually or you know, just key areas. He's not actually assigned to anything as such, but just floating around. So it's, it's good to have. It's oh, well, that's serious to me because Mike has got great rugby IP, hasn't he? He's um he's played for Hawks Bay. He's played over in the UK. He's he's had a very very good career. Yeah, he had a he had a outstanding career. I mean, yeah, like you say, Hawks Bay. Um, you know, was involved in Super Rugby here. Uh, didn't quite get it, and then moved moved over that way, and you know, captained. I think it was Edinburgh and, and then was involved with one of the other UK teams. Um, and, you know, he, he had to retire, unfortunately, due to injury. But, you know, it's good to have him back on board too. So oh, It'd be also good to get him on the show and have a chat to him at some stage because uh, he'd have some great uh, insights into, uh, you know, into the international window coming up at uh, at some point, Chris. So we'll, we'll reach out to him through, uh, through Cade. Well, and and also, um, you know, the other brothers are there, uh, Ben and Tim. Uh, they've come into the fold. So, yeah, how's that gone? So that's what we were just talking about briefly. So Ben <laughs> Ben came to us uh, early in, well, it would have been December, I think it was um, last year, sort of saying, I want to, I want to have a crack. I'm not not finished. Um, you know, I I sort of finished not how I wanted to with rugby. He had to, you know, be a part of the family business and those sort of things. So it's been great to have him back and. Through that process, like you say, he was trying to make some phone calls and recruit some people <laughs> around. But um, you know, it's, it's outstanding having him there. He's just he's a sta- he's a standard setter, you know. So mm-hmm. and that's what he brings to the team. And he also can show some of these younger fellas what what it's what it means to wear the Wyoming jersey or what it's about. And same with Tommy, you know, he's he's a passionate man. Um, he's always if if we get the W, he's the first man up there le- leading the team song. So. He's a character to have around, but um, it, it's great. Yeah, I mean, and and then there's Daniel Haitong. Yes, uh, you know, not 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 old, but uh, a guy who took the went away from the game. He's he's back playing with you, and I've heard that Jeff Leeper might pull on the boots. Is there any proof to that? Yeah, so yeah, we've got Daniel Haitong who's who's back. Who played his first game last week off the bench there and easing his way back in. Um, same thing. Great to have the experience, and he's. He's played over 100 games for us, so you know, and then obviously 
spent a couple of seasons at Maris, so he's a valuable asset. And I think Jeff Leeper has been hanging around training and doing some training, so we may see if he's on the field this weekend or next. We, I think he will be there at some stage, so it's great to have those guys. That, that makes them a very big and wise forward pack, doesn't it, to help the youngsters, uh, especially... Yeah. In the in the in the forwards, but also that back line, steer them in the right direction. I think very good. You've been a long-standing player in first grade with over a hundred games, and at a relatively young age, you moved into coaching. So, what prompted that move? Uh, it was mainly yeah a retirement from footy, uh, and that was due to injury slash well concussion, I suppose. Um, I mean, it was two thousand and twenty, so I was a you know twenty nine, thirty, and probably not finishing rugby in an age that I wanted to. I'd still like to be playing now, but um, unfortunately that was a call I had to make uh, due to just repeated concussions. And, you know, it's, it's the right call, especially when you've got a young family. It's, it's what you've got to do. So so tell us about that. What what was happening to you? So obviously you were recognising yeah. <laughs> that you were getting a few knocks in the head, but did it affect you as well? That... Uh, yes, it did. So originally I've had, I would have had a few concussions through my career and, um, when I was involved in the Tasman setup, and then also when I went down south as well, and then in that time frame of that 2020 or 2019 to 2020, I would have had about three in a short concession, mm-hmm. and the symptoms, you know, they they clicked in whether that came through headaches and and fogginess through to, you know, dealing with some anxieties that followed on from that, um, and you know, still having to deal with at this day from from those symptoms, but they still do. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's a work in progress. Um, I see some people to help me through those things, but um, it's just understanding, you know, that the the brain's an important part of your body, and you know, looking after it. So, well, that, yeah, like and, that. and it's obviously there's been a lot of discussion about this, but it was interesting when you know the stories came out like Carl Heyman, um, and you know, very similar to what you're saying that, that those types of symptoms and it. You know, sometimes you may think to yourself, oh, why am I feeling like this? Is it just me? You know, in the earlier days, you wouldn't have recognised that it was related to that uh, directly. But when you start hearing other players and you're saying, well, hang on a minute, that's me. Mm. I remember even Liam McDonald saying to me once, oh, man, I used to have bad, such bad headaches, you know, yeah. and and, and recognising that you just had to, to start pulling out a bit more. And um, I guess the old school way was to keep hammering it, keep going, you know. Mm. So what? But now we're starting to recognise those things, aren't we? Yeah, for sure. And uh, I mean, it's it's taken its time to get to where we are now. But I think you know we're there's a long way to go too. At the same time, but I mean, it is it is great that people are voicing you know what what's happening with, around concussion and those things. And and I think the more that happens, the more we're going to be aware of it going forward. So, so who counselled you, and who did you listen to the most to give the game away? Uh, well, personally, yeah, there was a few people involved at the time because I I did really struggle because it, rugby had been my whole life, mm. essentially. I mean, I was never a, a superstar or anything like that, but when you're a young Kiwi boy, it's all you it's all you know and it's all you want to do. So um, it was tough also giving the game away, but I had my, – my family was close. Um, that was probably uh, a key part. And then I actually had to seek some help um, through a therapist and those sort of things. Um, and that's you know that that guided me as well, um, which I think for young people if they're going through you know concussion or even other stuff that they should do because it, it does help. Oh, that's what I can promise. So so what's proven now? What we do know is that the one thing that must happen is you must rest your brain, right? So they're talking about twenty one days minimum, but you've got to listen to your body. Uh, and and it could be longer, you know. Uh, if you're still got headaches now and you've been retired, what a, a couple of years? Yeah, four years uh, nearly. So. Yeah, so four years is it? So you know you should never have never return to play. So it's up to the individual as to when they do. Mm-hmm. In senior rugby, you know the referees have this thing called the blue card. So if they and they're right there, if they can see a a, a person has taken a hit that's left them with symptoms of of concussion, they can issue a blue card now. At a JAB and junior level, it's more difficult, isn't it? Because the, the referees, they don't have referees. And so what they're trying to get people to do is self-report. Mm-hmm. So the coaches of junior players, mm-hmm. uh, the parents of junior players, self-report and stand them down. Would you agree with with, with those uh, 
introductions to the game? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think it has to happen. And, you know, you've got to be vigilant around it, especially with kids, you know, their brains are still growing, you know, so you've got to be careful in that sense. And I think, the, like you say, the stand down is key. You know, you, you look at boxers, they spend three, at least three months when they, you know, they go into a fight. So, I mean, if a kid's getting a concussion or a knock in the head, that it should be that three weeks minimum, I think. And and then, you know, they can get back playing after that. They can still work on their mm-hmm. skill work and those things in between. Um, but yeah, I think parents and like you say, the people around rugby at the time and their age grade stuff need to be, you know, cautious around it and look after the, the kids. Yeah, I think that's the most important message, Chris, mm-hmm. is uh, if, if you know, get them off the park. If, uh, if anyone's injured, Stand them down for at least a month if you're a kid, and uh, and then have good conversations before they even get back to play. After that, the the other important message too is don't be afraid to go and get checked because um, you know what you know started coming out is around secondary concussion. Mm-hmm. So you get concussion during the game, and then guys would come off the field, and then uh, guys and girls, and then not go get checked, but then later mm-hmm. um, collapse. So if you do get a, a, a pretty good knock to the head and you feel it, um, you need to go and get checked. Mm-hmm. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I think so. I think when you look back, I think much, well, when I look back on my career, rugby such a macho game, you know, yes. you've, you've got that persona. So it's, oh, yeah, I'm all right, I'm all right. But it's you look after yourself because, you know, if I could say one thing, I'd still love to be playing. And if I looked after myself better, I'd know mm-hmm. that I could be playing. So, um, and. Our age, you're a long time out of the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. so you do have to look after yourself. Well, well yeah. I'm pleased that yeah. uh, you know you're 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 getting better. Yeah, uh, and that's probably a bit of a journey, but at least now you're enjoying coaching and uh, being involved in the game still. So that's wonderful. Um, many of our uh, listeners would recall you as a Tasman Marco halfback. I certainly do. <laughs> okay, number uh, eighty-four was seven games over a couple of seasons. Firstly, 2010, and then then 2013, which was the year of uh, the uh, the great championship. So, uh, were those two years markably different in terms of the Marco setup? What stood out as being different in those two? Yeah, definitely. Years? I think uh, 2010, in particular, you know, what well, Tasman's only four years into the competition. So, I think. Tasman were trying to find themselves um, and what they were about, especially the playing group, the coaching group. Uh, there, was a, there was local guys there, but then there was also guys um, that had come into the region um, and, a, and a lot of young guys that hadn't played at that level as well. So I think 2010, um, it was it was a finding your feet process, whereas um, 2013 was a lot different. Um, 2013, there was a lot of guys out of well, and and Nelson that were involved, you know, in the through the club club scene that had come through over the last few years, and they'd built a culture, you know, and that had that had developed, and I believe that's probably due to this, you know, the success comes from the development in that stage. So, um, I would say there'd be there would have been 15 guys that are locals that came through, worked their butts off, you know, and and then they played for each other. Um, obviously, there was guys that come into the region that that tied yeah. into it nicely. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest difference, you know. Yeah. yeah so um, James Lowe had sh- shared that journey with you. I remember him playing club footy in 2011 yes. for Waimea Old Boys, and then you and he were in that side of 2013. And you probably named some others, but uh, did that have a lot to do with uh, Kieran and Kane and Leon McDonald? That on off field um, changes that showed success on the field yeah i think so i think those two you know that the coaching stalwarts obviously i mean look where leon is now and and kk was you know he had his, his ways about him but he knew how to you know get the best out of players um and then i think the group like i said the group there were some great leaders in there at the time that really stepped up with your shane christie's your joe wheelers all those guys they brought the group you know close together and, and tighten it so it's it's a combination of coaching and leadership in the right places. I think that's how we we see success. So yeah, so it's interesting though. Between twenty ten and twenty thirteen, you went overseas and and yes. had some experiences over there. Yep. So uh, I went over to Scotland for about six months there, um, due to not being able to play much after that two thousand ten season. I think I got injured in the first club game, and missed most of the season. So okay, thought let's go get some rugby experience overseas and. It was great, you know. You go over there as a young man, and 
you know, you get to live some life. So, I mean, I recommend it to anyone that sort of, you know, there or thereabouts, but can't quite get their foot in the door. You know, it's a different time of the year as well. So, you know, you're playing in the off season here uh, generally. So it's great. It's great. You, you want to play as much rugby as you can when you're a young fella. So, yeah, I, I, I would recommend it. Well, I remember personally observing you in 2011. You're a t- completely different person to the guy who walked back in in, in 2013. You know, you had a, a more worldly outlook and you were much more confident. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the change was quite dramatic. So life experience, that was really changing for you. Oh, for sure. You've got to learn to be, I mean, on your own. Obviously, Nelson's a small place. You've got family. You've got friends, all those sort of things. That it, But it's easy to just get yourself in a comfortable position. So you've got to... Once, once I stepped foot overseas, it was being uncomfortable and having to learn to live life on my own, and you know. And what was the rugby like? Uh the rugby, the standard. It was quite. Uh, it was, yeah, I guess a ten man game to a degree. Um, well, you were in it. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the key thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, they want to throw the ball. They wanted to throw the ball around over there, but they, I guess, the skill set sometimes let them down. So yeah. Have you got friends from that? time that you stay in touch with uh yeah i got a oh, well one of my flatmates that i that i live with um yeah oh, still i'll still stay in contact with him he's he's a great man so outstanding yeah. in 2015 you switched things up and uh you decided to move south to play for the university club in dunedin and also playing for otago 13 games mm. so what brought about that move uh it was sort of i guess in 2014, I um I felt like I had probably my best season on the field, um and I was feeling fit. And due to obviously uh, Tasman, they'd already had their halfbacks were signed. They had Jimmy Cowan and Billy Guyton at the time, um and there was no opportunity. So I thought, well, you know, this is sort of it. If you want to have a crack, this is this is the last last shot. So I decided to make a move down south. Had a had a brief conversation at the time with the coach, which was uh, Corey Brown. And he said, if you want to come down and have a crack, um, and then we can look at you. And that's sort of, it all prevailed from there after about five or six games of club footy. And then, yeah, things started moving from there. So it was great. As it transpired, you made your debut for Otago at Trafalgar Park <laughs> in a pre-season game against Tasman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell us about that. And did the family and mates all turn up to watch you? Yeah, no, it was an interesting one, actually. I, I, I never would have thought that would have been the case. But, <laughs> um, you know, it was great to be able to play against, well, my mates as well yeah, at, yeah. at the time. And then, like you say, family was there to watch. And, you know, I still still got a valuable memory at, at that time. There's a photo of me and um, my cousin, who was probably seven or eight at the time, and you know, he's got an Otago jersey on, even though they'd been Tasman through and through. You know, so it was it was good. It was good to be around the family and just been able. You know, it's a proud moment. So there was, yeah. there was also a photo of you about to feed the ball into the scrum and uh, Jimmy Cowan glaring at you. Yes. <laughs> that must Jeez, have that been quite yeah. yeah, he's a big unit, isn't he? So especially for a halfback. So no, it's, it's awesome. And you know, he was he was some that I, I I looked up to growing growing up as a kid. So nice. you know, playing against someone like of that caliber is it's awesome. And some of the people that you met down there, what who are some of the characters that influenced you? Uh, there's quite a few. I think um, being involved in a varsity side, um, you know, they they like to enjoy <laughs> life at the, at the fullest. And then um, and and the Otago scene was a lot different to to up here. You know, the, the, there's a lot of students and the lifestyle. So yeah, I mean, there was some great mates made down there that I haven't probably caught up with as a, as, as I'd like, like your Matt Fattis's, your um, Gavin Starks, those sort of people. But I've got a wedding of a good friend of mine, Mitchell Scott, um, yes. as you'd know, played yeah. for Tasman and um, also played many games for Otago, who's now lives down there and he's got a wedding in January. So I'm looking forward to getting around and I know a lot of people are going to be down there and catch up with those guys. So well, you as well as will be in good company down there. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> um now, your club has Shah Lowe on board uh, as your club capability manager. Shah, of course, plays netball, Chris, for prices, uh, prices by mere, I guess we'll call him, mm. um, and uh, is also the sister of James Lowe, one of the Waimea standouts in recent times. So uh, her role as club capability manager, do you think that's important to your club in terms of your long-term viability for your on-field and off-field 
uh, health and wealth. Absolutely, she's uh, she's been crucial, I think, to our club going forward. And and you know, you need people like her in, in that role. I guess she's uh, she's good at what she does. She communicates well with everyone, and she's I, I presume she's working overtime in the background. You know, she's probably it's not justified what she's doing. I, I wouldn't imagine. So, um, I don't think the club could survive without her. Um, you've got to have those people, and I think most clubs will be looking at that, and you know, and they're and needing a, a role like that because it is a paid role yes. uh the club capability and and it's not you know it's not a lot of money but it, it it just allows the clubs to get things done that they don't have volunteers with time to do so yeah um Shah's had success too she got some funding from uh bunnings warehouse to mm-hmm. upgrade the facilities so that was a, a real good feather in her cap yeah i think like i said she's she's probably doesn't get paid enough for what she does she's, she'll be working overtime so um you know there's obviously other people that are involved that don't get anything but that and they're helping out but i think you need more of them you know that there might be need to be two or three people like her involved in a club that are on some sort of funding if, if it's possible mm. you know all right and then another topic that we want to chat with every guest about is the future of club footy yes so you know there's there there's just a concern that Three years ago, we had 10 clubs. We've now got seven Div 1 clubs. The numbers in Division 2 are, 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 are not growing. Um, we've got three, four women's clubs. So what's the future of club footy, do you think, in your mind? Um, I think it's in a it's in a bit of a spot at the moment, um, probably throughout the country, to be honest, as well. Um, and I think that's taken its toll over the last five or ten years um, in particular. And I think that stems from the top. Um, that's my beliefs. Um, so I don't. I don't talk, know. Talk about that a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> bit, bit controversial, but no, I, no, not I at think. All. I think. Um, I think. Yeah, something's been happening at the top, and it hasn't been. You know, it hasn't fo- flowed down. I guess, and and we're not being looked down. I uh, looked after at the, at the lower levels, um, and even you know, I think there's got to be some sort of system change potentially. Um, I think the UK may have it as good as it's going to get and whether we need to follow suit here. So it might be everyone's in the one calendar from Super Rugby through to ITM Cup, um, Bunnings Cup now, I believe it's called, (laughs) Um, and then your club footy. So I think it sort of needs to be a stepping stone for each thing so everyone's got something to strive for and then you can have it in that one calendar. So so you're all playing at the same time, but you've got different divisions and... and it's uh, it's a it's feeding system. Yeah, it's a feeding system, I think, and that's the way it's going to have to be and uh, to keep moving forward, I, I believe. And then you've obviously got your international window where guys, you know, will step out of their super teams and then those guys in the ITM may step up into those super teams or something along those lines. I don't so know. I, so I uh, just about said it myself, Bunnings um, Warehouse. Uh, Bunnings Warehouse, NPC, plays same time as super. Yeah. And so it's going to be younger players. You might not get as many to the game but it it's if you like a, fe- a feeder through to to super rugby and it keeps yeah um provincial rugby alive i believe so uh, that's well that's my thoughts i think you know you look at the the crowds now they're not as big as what they were even at that level now so i think you, if you can build you know the right systems in place and and um fan base around each team i think you're gonna you can succeed in that level you know mm-hmm. So play club, get selected for your NPC team, get selected for your super team, become a representative player. Is yeah. that what we're talking about? That's that's the way I believe. Yeah, it. and 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 club first, I would think, yeah. has to be the way to go because otherwise you don't see your very best players. Yes. We, what you said about New Zealand rugby top down being a problem is everything's about the black jersey with them, mm-hmm. and so it seems to me that what they and the Rugby Players Association are aiming for is that you play at your school, you become a first 15 player, the very best of those go to a Super Rugby Franchise Academy, bypass their clubs, and then Super Super Rugby mm. All Blacks. It's fraught with danger. It it's is. fraught with danger I think for the is. survival of, of community club football. I think if you carry on through that way, you can end up like America. As I guess how you see the NFL and those sort of Particular sports, you know, you, they don't have grades in, in between or yep. they might have a, the odd social team, but I think it's it's either professional 
college or nothing, isn't it? And and that's the way it's heading, I believe, if we don't do something quickly about it. So so how quickly is this all becoming an even bigger problem? Yesterday. But yeah. I'll say yesterday. It needs yeah. to be done yesterday. Yeah. I agree with it. I yeah. agree with you, Kate. Uh, Kate uh, it's absolutely critical that something be done to address the, the health of the club game. It's all very well for kids, right? They can play at their club, but then if if it's then go to college or school, become a first fifteen player, and if you're not, you're you're lost to, mm. to to rugby. That's a real shame. But are you even lost in that? You know, you're losing kids at their their There's so many more opportunities out there. I think you know, in life these days, you've got sports. You've also got everything else out there. So, I think you know, if they want to keep building rugby and not see it drop off, they need to do something very quickly about it. A school's worried about because football has the same thing and some colleges are struggling and they're going back to amalgamate with clubs. So uh, secondary schools worried about, do they, I mean, do they get funding? Are they worried about, is it a way of attracting students to their school? What, uh, for instance, can you play club on a weekend and then have a weekday secondary school tournament? Does secondary school have to be at the same level as club? Can you do both? Oh, of course they have Wednesday rugby, they have Saturday rugby. You know, let's not forget, we've had a little bit of a win locally around age grade rugby, that's ages under 14, under 17, where there's a, a club window in the first eight weeks of the season and a school's window in the next eight weeks. But it, it, it's that drop-off at 18, you know, forget the drop-off at 14, that's very apparent, but there's also a massive drop-off at 18 to 24 where people are just lost to their rugby clubs and, as you say, do something else. They're certainly not coming back and, and being seen at games or in the club room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. It is. It's a big, big issue. Yeah. We'll keep asking people what they think <laughs> yeah, about that's it. Right. that's at right. At some point, we'll uh, we'll make up our minds and go and write a letter to uh, <laughs> Mark Robinson. <laughs> the Marco Rugby Roundup proposal <laughs> <laughs> to the New Zealand Rugby Union. <laughs> Okay. Hey, Kate, thank you very much for coming in. Really appreciate um, that and uh, carrying on the, the Wadding dynasty in, yep. the, in the world of rugby, albeit with Wymere. But yep. it's it's great what you're doing at Wymere and uh, keeping in the game with coaching. Uh, looks like uh, Wymere have got um, some plans ahead and uh, pulling some older heads in to see that club uh, get back to where it used to be. Uh, so that's absolutely fantastic. Good luck this weekend, big challenge, but sounds like you're up for it. Yeah, no, definitely. And and I appreciate you guys having me on here. And it's an honour to represent Waimea as, you know, as a as a person and a player and a, and a coach, you know, in the past and what it may be. So all the best with you guys as well and, yeah, you. you know, going forward. So All right. Guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Les. Uh, this weekend's plans for you? Oh, yeah, Trafalgar, so, Park. Trafalgar Park, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a derby, and uh, our club rooms are right next to each other, so it's very easy to uh, yeah. nip into to Nelson and uh, enjoy their company. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck to all the teams. Secondary, uh, second division, that's all underway. Is that... Uh, division two, is dead out. right. Yeah, so yeah. Marist have a, a bus trip to Collingwood. Ooh. That's something Ooh. to say, <laughs> doesn't it? Good so, way to start the season. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Uh, good stuff, and we must make mention of a couple of those games because we get stick for it. Yes, no, no. That's it for another edition of the Marco Rugby Roundup. Uh, my thanks to Cade and Les and also to the Turf Hotel. Come and check them out this weekend. You can catch this podcast on mbstalknelson.co.nz or on MBS Talk Nelson on Spotify. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week. The Marco Rugby Roundup. What's on, where, and when. It's the Talk of Nelson. NBS Talk Nelson.